Focus on your breath. Try to find a rhythm of breathing that feels good all the way down through the torso and even further down to the body if you can. You want to give the mind a place here in the present moment where it can stay with a sense of ease and well-being. Because the mind needs that ease and well-being. It's its foundation. Otherwise it goes running off with its thoughts, running to the future, running to the past, running everywhere but right here. Because it doesn't have a sense that it can be at home here. It's like a child in a family where there's a lot of problems in the family. It's going to run out of the house and after all you have trouble getting the child back. So make this a good place to stay, a good place to be. You can try deep breathing or shallow breathing, heavy, fast, slow, light. Try to find the rhythm and texture that feels best for the body right now. And that feels best for the mind, a place where the mind can stay still but alert. It doesn't feel like it has to go running out after things to find some pleasure. There's some pleasure right here. And we need this foundation because, as the chant said just now, we're subject to aging, illness, and death. We haven't gotten beyond them. There's a passage in the canon where there's an old man who's been sick, and he's recovering from his illness enough so he can come to see the Buddha. And the Buddha says, well, train yourself so that even though you may be sick in body, you don't have to be sick in mind. The man is pleased with the instructions, and he goes to see Sariputta. Sariputta asks him, what did the Buddha tell you? And the man said, well, the Buddha said to be, learn how to be not sick in mind, even though I'm, not, I'm sick in the body. And Sariputta said, well, what did he mean? And the man said, I don't know. So Sariputta explains. He says, you're, if you're attached to your body, feelings, perceptions, thought, fabrications, and consciousness, then as soon as these things change, you're going to suffer. As long as you see that they're yours, or that they're you, or in you, or that you're in them, you're going to suffer, because they're going to change. What you've got to learn how to do is not see yourself as in them, or not see them as in you, or see them as you. Or to see that you're somebody who has these things, then when they change, you're not going to suffer. It sounds a little abstract, but it's it's a very real sort of thing. If your body's ill, yeah, there's the, it's the fact that the body itself is ill, and there's the pain that comes with that. And as long as you're claiming the body as you or yours, or that you're in the body, being attacked by the pain. Or that the body is in you, and you're being attacked by the pain because it's inside you, then there's going to be suffering. So as long as you perceive things in this way, and you hold on to those perceptions, there are going to be stories around all this. Why is this body doing this to me? And what's going to be of my life? You can think about the things you can't do while you're sick, all kinds of things. The possibility that the illness might be fatal, where is that going to take you? As long, as long as you get tied up in these stories, you're going to suffer. So what you've got to learn how to do is pull yourself out of these things. And the first requisite is to get the mind into a good, solid state of concentration so it can step back from all these activities and see that it doesn't have to hold on to them because it's got something better to hold on to, the sense of stillness here in the present moment. Now, concentration requires four for qualities for it to really be powerful. Because the thoughts that come into the mind that are not skillful can be pretty powerful too, so you need something good and strong to fend them off. That's what the Buddha calls the four bases of success, which can also be translated as the basis of power. And it starts with desire. You have to want for this to work. 
Some people say, well, I'll just come to the meditation and if it works for me, okay, and if it doesn't work, I'll go someplace else. You've got to want for it to work, for it to work. There has to be a desire. We may have heard the Buddha said things about desire that it, the, it's the cause of suffering, and he does say that. But he also says it's a place for desire in the path. There are certain desires that are the causes of suffering, and others are part of right effort. So the desire to make the mind skillful, the desire to bring the mind to concentration, that's part of the path. It's not a cause of suffering. There will be some suffering in the sense that if you want it and it's not happening, that will weigh on the mind. But that, the Buddha said, is actually a form of suffering that's to be developed, cultivated, that so gives you the motivation to want to do this. You see this especially clearly when you're dealing with hindrances, things coming up in the mind that would get in the way of the concentration. Sensual desire comes up, and if you decide that you like the desire, you don't see it as a problem. Then no matter how many techniques you're given for dealing with sensual desire, they're just not going to work. You may chip away at it a little bit, but someplace in the mind there's a, there's a traitor to the whole cause, and it's going to get in the way. So you have to ferret that out to see why is it that the, that part of the mind doesn't want to gain the pleasure of concentration, doesn't, doesn't want to gain the stability and the health of concentration. And talk some sense into it, basically. And same with all the other hindrances. There's ill will. If you think of somebody that you'd really like to see suffer in, there's a part of the mind that really agrees, yes, that would be a good thing to see them suffer. And I can sit here and think about that for a while and be a good thing. Okay, you don't really have a desire for concentration then. Your desires are going someplace else. These are becoming the desires for the that cause suffering rather than lead to its end. When sleepiness comes on, it's all too easy for us to say, well, I guess I'm too tired tonight, I might as well just rest. Well, sometimes sleepiness is a ruse. The mind can do things to the body that make it sleepy, simply because it doesn't want to do the work. And so on down the line. But restlessness and anxiety. Part of the mind says some, a thought comes up about the future, you're worried about the future. I've got to think this through, I've got to worry about this, you tell yourself. It's a sign you don't really desire the concentration. When doubts come up and you decide that the doubts are strong enough to get in the way of the practice, why do you want to doubt? Why do you want to cut yourself off from the practice in this way? You have to ask yourself those questions, dig around a little bit in the mind, and then do what you can to motivate the mind so that it wants to practice. You can think about the dangers that come when the mind is not trained. You can see those pretty easily. Just walk into a hospital someplace and you're an old folks home and you meet up with people who haven't been training their minds and they're really suffering intensely. And do you want to be in that spot? Well, no. Okay, we'll do the work now. This is something that's really positive. It strengthens the mind. It gives you something you can really depend on. Because there will come that time when as I said, the doctors throw up their hands and say, well, that's all we can do. What are you going to do then? Well, you look for alternative medicine, but the alternative medicine doctors, they'll reach a point, too, where they have to throw up their hands. Ultimately, there comes a point where you're really on your own. It's just you and your mind. And if the mind hasn't been trained, it's going to cause you a lot of trouble. It's going to go latching on to some perceptions or latching on to some stories that they'll use to stab your heart. So you've got to train it so it doesn't do that. So that when these thoughts of that sort come up, you can see them as something it doesn't want to get involved with, and it really doesn't get involved. That requires training. So you think in these ways to, to give rise to a sense of wanting to do the practice and seeing the value of the practice. Another one of the bases of success is persistence, that you really stick with it. Now, this often means learning how to pace yourself. How much effort can I put in consistently? There are times when you need to put extra effort in because a particularly strong problem comes up in the mind. Other times the effort is a little bit more refined. But it's a matter of being 
willing to give time and energy to the practice, working on figuring it out. In fact, it's in the course of figuring things out, how to do things, how to get the mind down, that you get a lot of your discernment. This leads directly to the other two bases of power. One is intentness, that you give it your full intention and your full attention. As I try to say, you put your heart into it. So when you're watching the breath, it's not just counting how many more hours, how many more minutes before the session is over. It's how can I really see this breath? How can I really see this breath? And how can I figure out what there is to see there? Well, there's a sense of ease or dis-ease in the breath, which you can work with. And there's the question of can your mind stay focused or is it pulling off in other directions? If so, why is it pulling there? Look into it. When they talk about acceptance as a part of the practice, what it means is you accept the situation as it is in the present moment so you can figure out what's wrong with it, and then what you can do to fix it, make it better. The kind of acceptance that's unhealthy is when you just say, well, this is where things are, I'm just going to leave it there. That's not healthy. Well, the kind of unacceptance that's unhealthy is one that refuses to admit what's there to begin with. So you want to accept what's here, but also realize there are potentials for change. There are potentials for making things better, there are potentials for making things worse, which you're going to take. So you pay careful attention to what's going on to figure out how you can bring the mind to a greater sense of stillness. And when it's still, how to keep it there. And when it's been there long enough, how do you figure out how much is long enough? So you can start looking into where is there some st still some disturbance in here that I can let go and get the mind in a deeper concentration. Or if there's a particularly persistent distraction that keeps coming up. What is it about this distraction that has a pull on my mind? What's attractive about it? All too often the, the things that pull us away, we keep saying, I don't like that thought, I don't like that thought. Well, it's something about you likes the thought, otherwise you wouldn't be pulling, letting it pull you away. You've got to see it, what in the Buddhist terms are, is called the allure of the thought. And then you put the the allure right up next to the drawbacks. Our problem is that when we see the allure of something, we're forgetting the drawbacks, and when we see the drawbacks, we forget the allure. And we wonder why our mind is pulling us in different directions. It's because we won't let ourselves see the two at the same time. When you see them at the same time, you can make a comparison. And it's easier to let go of whatever it is, because you see that the drawbacks way outweigh the, the allure. These are some of the benefits that come from really paying careful attention to what you're doing. The last of the bases of success is circumspection. It's a word that has many meanings in Pali. We can also translate it as ingenuity. You can also translate it as discrimination. Or in other words, seeing clearly what's going on, making distinctions about what's skillful and what's not in the mind and figure out what to do about the things that are unskillful, figure out what to do about the things that are skillful. In other words, you bring your powers of analysis and ingenuity, because sometimes there will be techniques that you've heard that will be helpful, and sometimes you cannot think of a single technique that you've heard of that's going to help this situation, in which case you have to figure out your own. And you're encouraged to do this. As John Mahabhava said, there are many times in the practice when you come up with a problem and you can't remember anybody telling you about this particular problem. You try to think, well, what are the basic principles for dealing with a problem of this sort? And if you come up with a solution, then even though it's not in the books, it still counts as dharma. So you want to exercise your ability to think about the basic principles and then figure out how to apply them right here, right now, in a way that's effective for your particular problem right here, right now. 
Now, when you develop these four qualities, your concentration will have a lot of strength, it will have a lot of power. And that's when you'll be able to use it to peel the mind away from all the stories that make you suffer. I mean, the pain of disease, the pain of dying, largely comes not so much from the pains in the body, but it comes from the stories the mind is telling itself. Latching onto different perceptions, latching onto different narratives that it stabs itself with. And so you need the concentration to give you a space where you can pull back from all that and see it all as alien. There's a part of the mind that's doing that, but you don't have to get involved. And when it tries to stab your heart, don't put your heart in a place where you can be stabbed. These are some of the skills you can develop as you work on the concentration. So realize that this is a necessary skill for negotiating all the obstacles that life places in our way. Because whether we realize it or not, as soon as we were born, we signed on to aging, illness, and death. It was part of the package deal. And so as these other elements in the package start appearing in our experience, we need this skill in order to learn how not to suffer from them. Ideally, we can get to the point where we don't sign on to any more package deals like this ever again. But for the time being, focus on the skill that you're going to need so that when the body is sick, the mind doesn't have to be sick. Because it's not latching onto things that would pain it. That's one of the most important skills you can master. So here's your chance.